Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining this session. You, have, you will have two speakers. Uh, Michele, that's me. Uh, I am uh, from the big data architecture team, uh, while Gianluca Mirani is more on the data science uh, side. The topic uh, for today's talk is about industry for the toe. So there is a lot of hype around this topic. So what I'm going to do is to uh, give you a brief introduction about what we are talking about, and then we will deep dive into a real world use case. Before the end, we will also have a focus on uh, uh, Apache Spark, the previous speaker already introduced it, so we will share with you what we are already doing with this uh, uh, kind of technology. So, very quickly, uh, Industry 4.0, basically it is the idea to, um, to add uh, computer science intelligence into the physical equipment. So we have the production lines, uh, uh, possibly distributed uh, along different uh, uh, plants. And uh, if we put uh, uh, digitalization on these kind of machines, we can enable many different new use cases, uh, real-time monitoring, real-time alerting, the so popular predictive maintenance, so we can try to predict the failures before uh, they take place. Um, yeah, very quickly, this slide is about the technological pillars. Uh, probably many of you already know that there is uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, government foundings for the companies uh, who decide to upgrade their uh, equipment. And this slide uh, is uh, from the uh, Ministero dello Sviluppo Economico, and so they identified as nine pillars, and of course we are very interested in the nine, big data and analytics. Very high-level architecture of an uh, Industry 4.0 system. Uh, on the field, we start from the field, where of course we have all the uh, physical machines, and uh, what we need to do is to add uh, some kind of intelligence. Sometimes we have uh, uh, the newer machines that uh, they are already equipped with this intelligence. Sometimes we need to add uh, more hardware. So sometimes this physical machine, they can um, talk to a remote server autonomously. Uh, sometimes they need uh, a, an hardware device called gateway. Uh, here the landscape is very, very uh, heterogeneous because inside the company, the, uh, the production line, so we had a wide range of different uh, uh, machines. So sometimes we can also find 40 years old machines. Then we have uh, an IoT platform and IoT analytics. Uh, behind this keyword, we can uh, uh, find many, many different software solutions, and we're going uh, to talk a little bit about it. And once we collected the data from the physical world, we want to take advantage of this data, so the final users can access this data, dashboard, um, apps, uh, remote control, and so on. And uh, very important, uh, the integration of the sensor data with uh, the enterprise systems, such as the ERP system, the CRM system, and so on. Let's see very quickly a uh, focus on each component, and in particular on this field component. So we highlighted uh, how we can connect uh, a physical device to a gateway. So suppose that the physical machine is not able uh, to connect directly to the internet, we can add this gateway. The gateway is able to talk to the machine by means of standard protocols like Modbus, OPC, OPC UA, and so on. So basically we connect this gateway to the PLC, to the CNC, so to the uh, intelligence that is already on board, but this intelligence is not smart enough to connect, to talk with a remote server. If we have very old equipment, we can also go for ref retrofitting. It means that we can uh, update uh, our machines uh, in a hardware sense, so we can uh, upgrade the hardware uh, side. Uh, talking about the gateways, uh, we can run some open source uh, uh, software on this kind of gateways. One solution supported by uh, the Eclipse IoT community is called uh, Eclipse Cura. So it is a Java-based solution that can run into this kind um, of gateways. Once we collected the data, we have to send, we need to send this data to a server, possibly remote, it depends, 
uh, it is very common that this service is not remote, but in any case, we need a protocol, a standard protocol, to send this data, the gathered data, to a server. In this case, we can take advantage of very common MQTT, both MQTT and AMQP, they are um, message queue uh, frameworks. Uh, MQTT is a lightweight solution, so it is very common. And of course, we also need to reason about the, the connection. So we can go for Wi-Fi, but sometimes we can go for 3, 4, 5G, and the upcoming narrowband IoT. IoT platform, this is a very big um, topic, but uh, just one uh, crucial point here. We need to uh, ask ourselves if this, uh, you can just think of it uh, as the server doing a lot of things. Uh, we'll talk uh, maybe in another session about uh, how uh, an IoT platform looks like because in this talk we are talking, uh, we are focusing on the analytics part. So the crucial question is uh, uh, if this server is deployed on premise or in the cloud. If we go for the cloud solution, the two main um, solution providers are for sure uh, Microsoft Azure and AWS, but we have many other uh, providers, for example, PTC with Thingworks and many others. The focus of this talk is about analytics. So we gather the data, we store the data somewhere, and now we need to extract value out of this gathered data. And so that's why uh, smart people like Gianluca play to, with the data to extract such value. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm Gianluca. Uh, I will talk to you about the analytical uh, process, about uh, data analysis. So we, uh, we have all our data collected by um, IoT devices, and we want to make something. We want to extract value from this data. Uh, this is our scenario where uh, data comes from machinery. Uh, we are in the field of mechanical engineering industry. Uh, we have uh, production lines, one or more production lines, uh, that are working 24-hour uh, day, excluding some uh, breaks due to uh, shift changes or uh, technical stops or maintenance stops or uh, machinery failures. Failures uh, is what we try to predict. Um, we have uh, uh, different kinds of data. Each data source includes a uh, different kind of data. We have alarms, different kind of alarms. We have uh, production process data, like uh, sensors data from the IoT devices. And we can measure um, different uh, variables about the process, like uh, the number of uh, pieces, that are produced every, every interval of time, and uh, the number of faulty pieces, the efficiency, efficiency of the process, the energy consumption, and so on. Uh, we have also some environmental data, like temperature, pressure, uh, and we have logs uh, that um, describing human interventions and um, planned stops for maintenance, for example. And the final data uh, are about uh, failures, so that are unplanned stops. Okay, uh, we worked um, we worked on uh, about uh, 42 million records. That uh, it, we are midway between um, um, the, the volume of data that that we can uh, analyze in a in a laptop. We're not really into big data with this quantity of records, but we are analyzing only uh, 30 days. So um, the sensors send data with an average rate of about 57,000 records per hour. It's not so much, but uh, it's, okay. it's um, uh, an average amount. Okay, and data are collected in a log format. So. Uh, we have a uh, um, few columns and a lot of rows. So for analytic, we know that we must transform mm, this data. 
um, okay, sometimes we have to deal with non-contiguous time interval uh, because um, maybe some measures are taken uh, along uh, a period of time, then we have uh, a stop maybe for holidays, for example, and then we start uh, measuring other data. Okay, let's see some um, data description, how data are made. Uh, this is a typical, um, typical aspect of our uh, data that are alarm data and uh, uh, each uh, alarm data uh, reports um, different kind of anomaly. Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, get the exact uh, uh, timestamp when the problem is happened and the line in the sector where the problem has been detected. Uh, there are a lot of different types of uh, alarms. There are 200, more than 200 uh, types. And we needed the help of a domain expert to, um, to, decode, to decode all different types of, of alarm. Sometimes uh, you cannot understand what's going on. For example, error D2, who knows? We have, all, uh, we have sensor data, so uh, data about uh, production process. Um, this time we have uh, something like uh, 183 uh, sensors, different sensors located in uh, different parts of the machine. Uh, what kind of measure do we collect? We have uh, temperatures, angles, um, linear speeds, rotation speeds, and so on. We can measure the overall equipment effectiveness, that is an, an index uh, varying between zero, zero and one. We, we can measure the number of units produced per time unit, okay, um, faulty and... Uh, um, and okay. <laughs> and we have the total working time and stopping time of the, of the machine. Um, here we have also to deal with different uh, time interval because some uh, sensor sends a signal every 10 seconds, for example. Some, uh, some other uh, send, signal, uh, every send, uh, send a signal every minute or every couple of minutes, 10 minutes. So we have to deal with these uh, um, different periods. Finally, we have uh, uh, environmental data that measure um, things like inside or outside temperature, air temperature, humidity and pressure, because um, some phases of the production process could be affected by this um, climatic variation. Uh, these data sources are, are external, so they aren't um, uh, collected by the same IoT devices that works on, on the machine. And uh, here we have uh, about one observation per hour. Uh, these are planned stops log. Um, so we, we collect logs about ma maintenance. And uh, they come with, with timestamp, um, a description of the intervention that is a manual description. And uh, at this phase of the project, this information must be manually coded to be uh, part of the analytical process. So we are in the industry 4.0, but sometimes we need to write down in a, in a file manually some information because they are not yet coded, not yet available. Paper, yes. Finally, we have the most important uh, source that is the failure. Uh, that's it, that is the event which we are trying to predict. We are, uh, we are doing uh, predictive, predictive maintenance, so we, uh, what we want to do is to intercept this kind of events before they happen. Um, how many times uh, before it happens we can intercept this phenomenon? It, it depends on uh, a lot of factors. And um, another time, this is not a clear data source, so we have to do a lot of data, data cleaning uh, to extract this information. Uh, sometimes um, what is um, 
what is marked with failure is not really a failure. So we have to look a lot of variables. We 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 did a lot of um, uh, descriptive anal uh, analysis to intercept uh, failures, and this is crucial because uh, false positive uh, or omitted failure in the other way are likely to produce a model that is biased. So it has. Um, uh, it, it, the, the model in this way cannot produce, cannot perform predictive maintenance. It is useless. Our goal, as I said before, is to enable predictive maintenance using, using all these variables. Um, the higher is the frequency of the observed data, and the greater can be the time available to make a correct, corrective maintenance. Uh, but the, the efficiency of the uh, process, of the forecast, depends on uh, also another factor. That is, uh, have I observed all the data that I can observe, or are there any variable that I can't observe and that can be crucial for uh, performing predictive maintenance? That, uh, that is what uh, sometimes happens. So I know that mm, a variable that can help me to perform predictive maintenance exists, but I can't measure it. Or, um, in the worst case, I, I have no idea of what is going to make my machine fail. So I, I cannot measure it. Um, there can be also problem of biased measure because I um, I trust IoT sensors, but who knows uh, who knows is the measure is uh, are collected in the right way. Okay, uh, this prediction model one uh, once it is um, trained and tested uh, should be deployed and queried in real time to anticipate next failure. So. Every time, every fixed uh, interval of time, I must uh, query the, uh, my model to get, uh, to get an answer. Is it going to fail or not, in the simplest way? Okay, let's see some uh, implementation, Pyth some Python implementation of this process. Uh, this is the data pipeline we used to follow to perform uh, uh, predictive maintenance, that is, Okay, data ingesting. Um, after we we had a long uh, phase of data cleansing and manipulation, uh, feature design and feature extraction, descriptive analytic, descriptive analysis and graphical analysis, and finally modern training and testing. With uh, we use the supervised training uh, technique of machine learning. This is our toolkit. That is. Uh, pretty standard toolkit for data analysis with Python. We use the um, pandas for um, uh, stored data, then uh, pandas and numpy for descriptive analysis and data cleansing, feature design, feature ex extraction, matplotlib for graphs, and scikit-learn for model training and testing. Okay. Well, I'm going fast on this because we only in just text file at the moment. So there's no technology uh, behind that. But we will see in the next steps uh, um, that uh, there can be something more. Okay, I'm going fast on this. It's quite boring. Okay, data cleansing. We have this kind of data in a log format that uh, have only three columns, but a lot of different measures and measure types. Okay, there are any kind of uh, outlier, null value. Um, most of the codes must, must be recorded uh, or they can be ignored if they signal false alarms, all that kind of, of things. Uh, some of the value are strings, so we have to transform in set of variables. In, in this case, we use the one-hot encoding. Uh, we must pivot data, so we have the data in long, in log format, so 
long format, and we have to transform it to wide format, where uh, timestamp is the only uh, index of our row. That let us um, to join all different data sources. Um, second thing, there are uh, different time spans across all data sets, and we had to harmonize uh, them. So we must choose um, a time span that um, lead us to put all data sets together, and we choose a 10 minute time span. This is the result of different tri of a trial and error uh, procedure that lead us to decide for this uh, time span. At this point, we have lots of variables. We, ha we, we made the analytical data set with uh, more than 180 variables sen from sensor, 200 ca categorical variable from alarms, uh, environmental data, and one target variable that is failure. It's a binary feature, one, failure, zero, not failure. Okay. Um, uh, looking at, at this graph, this is a correlogram, we can see that there are clusters of observation of variables that have a strong correlation. The more intense is the color, the, more, the higher is the correlation. And we know that in modeling data, we, we should avoid that kind of thing. So what we did, we did the uh, dimensionality reduction. We used um, we use the PCA technique, principal component analysis. That means that starting from uh, 200, uh, what, 183 variables, we extracted the first 16 principal components of sensor data that can explain about 75% uh, of the total initial variable. Okay, so we are losing the 25% of the information, but we, keep, we kept only 16 out of 118 numerical variables to re reduce dimensionality. Then we uh, constructed uh, rolling measures. Rolling measures, um, uh, why, why we, we made uh, um, this kind of measures? We needed to spread variability over contiguous time windows. So we aggregate the measure, like a mobile average, for example, using different uh, functions, like average, minimum, or maximum. Uh, this let us um, to keep track of data variability. Okay. At the end, um, we, um, what we did is to spread failure events back in time. This let us uh, to correlate those events, the failure events, with other observed variables. That means that given a failure at time t, we need to raise failures in each of the n time intervals preceding the actual failures. So all the time interval uh, preceding the actual failure are marked as failure. Because uh, var variables changing, um, we must correlate the x variables to the failure, anticipating the phenomenon. The bigger gets n, and the longer will be the failure pred prediction time window. At the same time, if we increase too much this value, we lead to an overestimation of failure events. Uh, in our case, we used a 10 minutes time interval, and uh, we used n equal to 3. That means that we, we can identify failures 30 minutes in advance. Okay, this is the final, final data set. After all the data cleaning, data transformation, dimensionality reduction, and so on, we obtain a final data set that has about uh, 16 variables and our target variable that is the failure. These are some graphs about the uh, sense alarms data. We can say that they are strongly co correlated this was before the dimensionality reduction. These are some graphs about um, stopping time and working time on, of the machine and the equipment effectiveness. Okay. 
let's see the model training. We used the scikit-learn library to train different classifiers that are binary classifiers. These are the, all the models we tried from logistic regression, that is a quite simple model, to SVC, it is a variation of the uh, SVM, gradient boosting, decision tree, random forest, and so on. Okay, we have to deal with another problem. Uh, when you do a binary classification, you have to uh, you have to deal with imbalance. So when you have when uh, your positive case that in our case were were, uh, were the failures, um, if they consist in a small fraction of all data, your model is uh, likely to work not so well. So we use uh, we perform oversampling technique using this library called SMOTE uh, that is contained in the library imblearn and uh, it uses the k -near nearest neighbor method. Finally, there's a phase called uh, evaluation of the model. So we split the, the, our data in training test and testing set uh, with uh, we use cross validation. And uh, we aim to have a good uh, total accuracy, but we must also limit the amount of false positive because every, um, every, uh, every time the model identifies a failure, it, uh, the model triggers some, some kind of uh, warning. Okay? We, don't, we don't want to warn every time the model gets a false alarm. So we must limit the amount of false positive. But at the same time, we want to intercept the majority of failures. So we want to have a high recall. So what we must do is to find a trade-off between those two kinds of error, errors. Uh, usually, increasing one leads to in increase, uh, to, sorry, Incle uh, increasing recall rate leads to uh, a higher false positive rate, so we must be careful in the hyperparameter tuning. Uh, this code, um, this code down, uh, let us find the um, optimal uh, hyperparameters configuration to extract um, the best hyperparameter for each model. So these are these are the results. Uh, well, I think in in, uh, in lab data set, usually you have a 0 0.98, 0 0.99 precision and accuracy. In this case, we have uh, uh, a low precision. The winner model is Gaussian naive base, and we have a 0 0.45 of precision. It's not so much, okay? We have a good recall, 0 0.87. That means that... Uh, if one, uh, 100 is the number of failures, we can intercept 87 of these 100. It's not, not so bad. But at the same time, uh, of the 100 um, intercepted failures, only 45 are real failures. So we have 55 false alarm. That's, that are a lot. So we are working on, on that. My part is over, and I let Michele finish and talk about Pi Spark. Thank you. It's okay. Okay, so uh, we are at the very beginning of this uh, project. So uh, so far, we don't have big data problems. But the question is, what if we have big data, for example, in the original data or in the prepared data? So we can take advantage. Uh, of uh, distributed uh, engines like Apache Spark. I'm not going to talk about vertical and horizontal scalability, also because the, the previous uh, speaker already introduced this, uh, uh, this scalability uh, approach. For those of you who are not familiar with Spark, we are talking about distributed engine, and the only important part is this one. We have four different programming languages, and of course we are using Python. The Spark version is called PyPython. We can do a lot of things by means of this distributed engine. We are very interested in the Spark SQL, especially for data preparation, and Spark MLlib, which is the uh, 
uh, machine learning library that allows us to train and test uh, uh, big data sets by means of a distributed architecture. So we can use Spark, for example, for data cleansing, manipulation, and future design. And this is very common nowadays because we are already collecting a lot of data. Also in other projects, uh, it happens very uh, often that we need to reduce the data size by aggregating, uh, by filtering records out, and so on. So we have a huge amount of raw data, and in order to run uh, our algorithms or to create a dashboard, we need to reduce the data size. So it is uh, already uh, in place the fact that we use a lot of uh, PySpark, and in particular Spark SQL, in order to reduce the data size, because we have a lot of uh, raw data. It is less common, but we are already experimenting it. Uh, the problem that uh, we also need, also after the, the size reduction, we still need to run to the training phase against a big data set. In this case, we can take advantage of Spark MLlib. So Spark SQL it is very important for data manipulation. We, it is an almost fully compliant uh, SQL interface, so you can uh, uh, run aggregation, uh, Windows function, very important. And so by means of Spark SQL, PySpark version, you can prepare your data properly. And we already do it a lot. What we are doing, um, to be honest, uh, less frequently, but uh, we are very close to need uh, this kind of distributed machine learning uh, functionality, is the ability to take advantage of Spark ML Lib for future engineering and for uh, model training. So Spark ML Lib uh, is heavily inspired to scikit-learn, so you can recognize a lot of methods and approaches. So the, the code is slightly different, but what's important here is that we are going to run, to execute the, the algorithms that we already know in a distributed fashion. But from the programmer point of view, you are not changing your approach, you are slightly changing the code that you are writing, but more or less it is very uh, similar to uh, scikit-learn, but uh, it works against the huge data sets. And this is just an example of random forest. You can check on the website. Uh, you have a lot of uh, algorithms that are already supported, still, uh, still working because it is not uh, complete for sure, but uh, it is a very good approach. So this is the case when we have a lot of data also for the training uh, model. Just to, to finish our presentation, next steps. Uh, so far, since we are at the very beginning of this project, we are just moving the input files as uh, text files, but we are also reasoning about uh, the automatization of this process of the data ingestion phase uh, by taking advantage of streaming technologies, for example, Spark streaming. By means of Spark streaming, we can perform the ETL, so the transformation, the aggregation on the fly. And we can also uh, execute the predictions on the fly uh, by leveraging Spark streaming. So we are thinking of using Spark. We already use it for the, uh, let's say, data manipulation part, but we are planning to use it also for the uh, model. And uh, we are also thinking uh, about the model deployment uh, as a web service, for example, by means of Spark, or as a streaming service by means of Spark streaming. The game is over. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yes, we have. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Very interesting. Uh, do you have any questions in Italian or in English? The two one in the back. Oh, I haven't understand how you resolve the problem of different uh, frequency of data. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, we, we tried different combination of time windows, okay, and uh, the, the real question is how to measure the effectiveness of the transformation. We train the models with different time windows and then we look it at the usual metrics of uh, classification evaluation like uh, 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 
uh, ROC area under the curve or uh, accuracy or F1 score. So we look at, at the um, classification metrics, the final classification metrics, because is the only way we can measure the how model is working with different time windows. We have the we we haven't enough uh, um, other methods to determine if it is working or not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, have you considered edge uh, and uh, computing or analytics at the edge as a potential future solution to this type of uh, analytical uh, project? So the question is about edge computing versus uh, cloud or centralized. Well, we are working on it because you know uh, sometimes you can take advantage of edge if the problem that you are solving is completely local, and this is the case. But you know, it is a long journey. We are just at the beginning, so the company just started to collect the data, and we are at the very beginning for sure. For let's say local problems, we are going to to put this intelligence at the edge because we can take advantage of the computing power of the gateway that we added to the machines. So it is a long journey, and we are really just at the beginning. Ti faccio la domanda in italiano perché sarebbe troppo articolato da fare in inglese. Mi Mm, vorrei soffermare un attimo sul, sull'elaborazione del dato iniziale, quindi dato che comunque anche per me questo è il mio pane quotidiano. Um, il, si parla comunque di fonti dati eterogenee, quindi non definibili almeno da quello, che, da quello che ho visto nel corso della mia esperienza, non definibili all'interno di un modello statico, di un database piuttosto che... Eh, di conseguenza le nostre, come dire, i nostri sforzi si sono orientati verso l'utilizzo di mh, strutture dati dinamiche, quindi di conseguenza basi di dati eh, correlate ad oggetti JSON. Mi chiedevo mh, come funziona il tutto, anche perché non, non mi è molto chiaro, lato vostro, mh, ad esempio l'acquisizione dati da un trasduttore posto in campo relativamente eh, al campo di misura dello spettro mh, dello spettro energetico piuttosto che l'acquisizione dati da un PLC posizionato su una linea di produzione chilometrica. Quello che succede finora, allora, la data ingestion ad oggi non è automatizzata, come avevamo detto. Comunque sostanzialmente le sorgenti che, i dati che abbiamo sono i dati che arrivano dal PLC, quindi sostanzialmente sono tutti i registri con i loro valori, quindi puoi usare come coppie chiavi valore, e quelli sostanzialmente vengono presi allora, ad oggi, ripeto, siamo tutti in, mettiamo assieme CSV ad oggi. Poi, come immaginiamo che possa diventare che questi dati vengono continuamente riversati per esempio su un hadoop, anche così in modo grezzo, poi sarà da capire se, se non c'è necessità di real time, magari penso, ogni notte li rielaboriamo, li normalizziamo, oppure se serve andare più veloci con Spark Streaming, fai le TL al volo. Comunque ad oggi quello che mettiamo assieme sono fonti disparate dove sostanzialmente ne vedo diciamo tre grossi. I dati del PLC che li puoi pensare come coppie chiavi valore, dati energetici che però arrivano da un altro sistema, e ad oggi ancora CSV, e poi manualmente, perché attualmente sono su carta, le manutenzioni. E ad oggi lo facciamo, come dire, nel, nel notebook questa integrazione. L'automatizzazione di tutto ciò cioè, è work in progress. Però quello che mi immagino, poi vedremo, sarà quello di riversare tutto su una DUP, più o meno normalizzato, al volo o non al volo. Prego. Ok, thank you very much. We are around, so if you have other questions can intercept us. Thank you very much. Thank you.